If you were a rapper and your idol told you they wanted to sign you and bring you to the top, you would probably say yes. It would probably even be a dream come true. However, it turns out signing to a rapper is actually one of the worst things you can do. And on the flip side, signing other rappers can be just as horrible as well. So if it's so horrible, why is it such a common practice? Who has done it? And how did it end up going so poorly for all parties involved? My name is Rishav Bashir, and this is Rappers Whose Record Labels Failed. The first rapper on this list is the infamous Kanye West, or Ye, as he goes by now. Once upon a time, Kanye's record label, Good Music, was at the top of the artist-rapper-led sphere. As much as people didn't believe he could do it, for a short period of time, Kanye birthed superstars. Kid Cudi, Big Sean, John Legend, Pusha T, and even producers like Hit Boy and a young Travis Scott. But today, Kanye West's Good Music is actually not even a real label anymore. So why did this happen and how? And I know you may have your hunches, but it's actually a lot more complicated than it may seem. But before we dive into his downfall, how did Kanye's Good Music even come into fruition? Good Music was launched right after Kanye blew up with his debut album as a joint venture between Kanye and Sony Music, who fun fact, he wasn't even signed to. Its first singer was actually John Legend, who stayed for a total of 12 years and became a huge signee, going on to have a massively successful career. Two months after signing, Legend dropped his debut album, selling 100k and earning three Grammys. This was huge for good music as it showed that Kanye had what it took to identify talent and bring them to the mainstream stage. So clearly, good music was off to a great start. And for years, they were able to pump out high selling albums commercially and maintain their reputation as a force in the industry. However, this is not the good music that fans think of today, as good music was yet to have its real shine. You see, the 2000s era may have had commercial success, but the 2010s era of good music was what solidified the label as not only real players in the game, but one of the most influential labels out there. And by the time the early 2010s hit, Kanye had begun to sign a number of artists who were unknown at the time, but would go on to have quite successful careers in the industry. Rappers like Big Sean, Kid Cudi, and Pusha T would become the new age rappers of Kanye. Big Sean got signed off of a freestyle, Kid Cudi would get signed after meeting Kanye at a store, and both of these artists would shoot up in the music industry. Kid Cudi became one of the largest hip hop acts of the 2010s. Day and Night became Good Music's biggest hit, peaking at number 3 on Billboard. His debut project, Man on the Moon, was also huge, reaching top 5 on Billboard and earned 3 Grammy nominations. Later, Pusha T would also get signed as well and have a successful career of his own. On top of that, Good Music artists would collaborate with one another and all sell pretty well. So it was pretty clear that Kanye had built a solid roster. What's more, Kanye's record label was different due to the fact that they were able to find artists that were able to sell very well commercially, but also have albums that held critical acclaim, a rare feat that only artists such as Playboy Cardi have been able to come close to in today's day and age. So with all of this early success, you would think that Kanye was ecstatic about good music. However, that was far from the case. To Kanye, developing and managing all of these artists' careers was a burden that he did not want, and had actually expressed his frustration with the job a couple years back. In an interview with Billboard where he said, Running a record label was the biggest mistake I ever made. I never asked to be a label owner. Sony offered it to me, and I took it. But I can't be there when people are calling me to the studio to hear some music or approve clothes for a video. No disrespect to anybody. My focus is on graduation. I've got a hard enough time calling radio programmers and getting them to play Can't Tell Me Nothing, a song that's connecting with people but only at 1,400 spins. So Kanye made it clear that his solo career was more important to him and that personally he wasn't even at where he wanted to be, which is true, he wasn't. But despite all of that, Kanye somehow found a way for it to work. And I guess he decided if he was gonna help these artists out, it might as well be in a way that benefited him too. So from 2010 to 2012, Kanye made moves that would solidify good music as one of the largest artist-run record labels, but also in a way that boosted his career as well. And when he dropped My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, it featured almost every good artist, helping give them a spotlight while he'd benefit from their talent as well. Then, he really put the label on his back on the project Cruel Summer, the good music compilation album. It debuted at number one on the hip hop charts, selling 205,000 first week, and it looked like Kanye was ready to take the label to the top. That year, 2012, was really the peak of the decade for good music. John Legend was still huge, Pusha T was going up, Big Sean was going up, 2 Chainz was going crazy, Kid Cudi was looking great. Kanye had planted the seeds for multiple artists to become stars, and they were all ready for liftoff. Some had already taken off. That year, I guess Kanye was feeling a little selfless as well. He put out a lot of remixes with good music members, and even signed Travis Scott to good music as a producer with a publishing deal. So it seemed like the label had everything set. And if it had just played its cards right, it could have been the next cash money, especially when you take into account how every artist from the past decade basically idolized Kanye, meaning it was not only a slam dunk on the music side, but on the business side as well. It really looked like good music was about to become one of the most timeless and recognized record labels of the decade. But just when everything looked like it was going perfectly, tragedy struck for good music. All of a sudden, everything started to stagnate 
and then came crashing down, beginning with Kid Cudi, Good Music's most successful signee. In 2013, Kid Cudi had no Kanye features or any Good Music features. Fans were confused. Why not, right? Well, it turned out that it wasn't Kid Cudi's fault. Kanye just didn't want to work with him, and he was frustrated with that. That year, Kanye dropped Yeezus, and the good music artists were left to fend for themselves, all scattered, and Cudi was one of them. This would only be the start to the on and off decade long feud that Kanye and Cudi would go through. So after a year of not being able to patch things up, and I'm sure even more disagreements from the years prior, Kid Cudi, arguably good music's artist with the most potential, suddenly announced he was no longer a part of good music, saying, Kanye and I were talking on the phone the other day, and apparently, had given him the green light to do his own thing. Of course, Kanye wasn't pleased. You know how many people wish they could be signed to good music, get their light changed? Had an opportunity? Never forget that! I'm so hurt! I feel so disrespected! Kid Cudi, we two black men in a racist world! And that's where things fell off. Right after that, Hit Boy, another one of the biggest signees, left the label and he'd go on to become one of the most accomplished producers of the 21st century. After that, the label hit a huge rut, and from 2012 to 2016, were practically at a standstill. But good music was still very much a thing. Not every artist had left, and in 2016, Kanye decided that it was time for him to usher in a new era of good music. Just like he had done previously, so many years before. So that year, he did just that. He dropped Life of Pablo, signed artists like Designer, and his friendship with Kid Cudi rekindled. Furthermore, there were rumors that Tyga and Migos were going to sign to the label, but nothing ever happened. However, two years later, in 2018, it seemed like good music was really about to have a resurgence. Designer, Valet, Jack West, and more were going nuts, and Kanye had a couple of other artists he seemed to have been developing to shock the world. That year, Kanye announced multiple good music album releases, Pusha T's album Daytona, a solo Kanye project, Kid See Ghosts, and the Tiana Taylor album. Five albums all slated to release in a row, all in the span of two months. We hadn't seen good music this active in years, and to fans of Kanye, it looked like they were about to go on another run. But it didn't. Instead, something much different happened. Because in 2019, there were no albums from any of Kanye's artists. Which is fine, they had just dropped a bunch in the year prior. But what was weird was their new artists weren't dropping. No designer album, no valet album, or an 070 shake album, two years after they had all been signed, and even years for some. This was destroying their careers and just a lot of wasted potential. It was clear Kanye was neglecting his artists. In the first half of his career, he'd put them on projects, have them write for him, like Cudi did for 808s and Heartbreaks, give them features, etc. But these new artists were more so just for Kanye to use than help. However, Kanye realized this, so he decided that he would make Pusha T the president of good music, meaning that from then on, Pusha would be helping the artists out. So it seemed like Kanye had swallowed his ego and made the right move for his artists. Hats off to him. Except, if you know Kanye, he would never do that. And that never really ended up happening. Even after making Pusha T the president, Kanye's ego still made him pull the strings from behind the scenes. A lot was going on at the time with him. And uh, um, he was like, hey man, I think, um, I actually think I can do this better. And I was like, all right. You know, I'm ready to come out though, I'm like fuming inside. And so I'm like, you know, he's like, um, I think I can do it better. For example, he forced every artist to make each album seven tracks long in 2018 when they were dropping back to back, which was just unnecessary. And what's interesting is Kanye's control from behind the scenes was kept a secret at the time. And Kanye's behavior would soon begin to enrage many of his artists, starting off with designer. You see, Life of Pablo featured Designer, but apparently Designer was only signed for that album, and after Kanye had fulfilled his use, Designer was disposed of. Keep in mind that Designer was not some random artist. He had two not platinum, but diamond songs, something even Beyonce or superstars like Justin Bieber don't have, and the fact that Kanye did more for someone he met at a store and randomly heard a freestyle from shows how much he didn't care about his artists at that point of his career. This was also when another good music vet left as well, John Legend, after more than a decade with the label. So at this point, what Kanye was doing was actually pretty messed up. No matter how big of a fan you are of him, it's wrong. The designer situation was especially sad. He was super hyped to be signed by Kanye, 
had uncapped potential and what Kanye did to his career really affected him for life. When Designer first blew up, there was a ruthless 11 label war going on over who would sign Designer. Following the success of his smash hit Panda, labels were offering him the moon and more. Boatloads of money, promises of a huge career, everything, of course. But all it took was one short phone call from Kanye West and Designer forgot about all of that. He described the moment he got signed like this. Everything kind of like blacked out. Once I heard him saying he called, I ain't gonna lie, like, I'm like, word, cause I'm so moving and like, the moment I'm like, yo, I, I just been through like 11 labels, it's late at night too, so I'm like, yo, I bet. And to be honest, I can't really blame him. Imagine Kanye says he wants to sign you. Most artists would melt. And Designer was no different. Travis Scott, Drake, Lil Wayne. Most artists would sign in a heartbeat, especially when they're a huge inspiration for a lot of the new rappers that have come up. Designer was one of them. But it's actually nothing new. And it's happened to rappers who've become really successful themselves, such as Tyga, who didn't even look at the contract when he signed to Lil Wayne. He's recording Carter 3, so I'm just, I'm just... It's in, in the yeah, sauce it's right weird. now, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, like, right. and then we did uh, Bad Rock, and it's like, you know, you got to sign. You want to get on? He's like, this is gonna be the single. I was like, all right, cool. So I signed. I didn't even think about it. Didn't I didn't, I didn't think twice. Yeah, so when Kanye first signed Designer, he was super happy to be around Kanye. Man, son, Kanye, man, he's a trip. You did. He took me around. First, I was going to the studio. Then I was on my way to the airport. It was crazy. Just the feeling, just the adrenaline. It was just crazy, man. Me and Kanye and his ghosts in front of TMZ. It, it, it was crazy. And was under the impression that Kanye was going to mentor him. I took the Kanye on beside work, just some brother tips and just hooking it up. You know what I'm saying? My man about to make the beats. He's back in the music of making beats and everything for people. So a lot of artists is in the game or, you know, his artists is going to have some of his beats to jump on my album. It's just going to be crazy. Yay, working. Everybody doing good. The family doing good. He's he good. But eventually, things started going horribly. Kanye gave Designer a couple of pretty cool opportunities, like featuring him on Champions, which was a pretty big deal. But I'll keep it a buck. After that, Kanye essentially cut him off. And just like that, Designer had to fend for himself. When Kanye took Designer on tour, Designer's father was in a coma. He explained that he didn't want anything from Kanye or to use him for success, but just someone to talk to. No one would help. Because the reason why I left, yeah, was um, it's because, you know, I was going through like a little mental thing. I was coming up out of high school. My pops just went in a coma. You know what I'm saying? So... And it was at that moment that Designer realized Kanye was a psycho. He took to Instagram to say that he got all his success himself. Nobody that's doing this shit for me, bro. Nobody. Nobody that's doing this shit for me. I don't, I, like, I signed the Kanye West, the biggest nigga. And although the world thinks Kanye is a genius, he was the one who actually brought good music as a label. To me, nigga, I brought good music back, nigga. And everybody know that, nigga. So what y'all talking about, I fell off. Back. Designer then expressed that he wished things weren't how they were, and he liked to leave the label tweeting, free me from this label. And it got so bad, he started to take to the public to try and garner support to get out of his deal. In 2021, he dropped a song called Letter to Ye, trying to explain his feelings. I doubt Kanye cared though. And it was clear to everyone that Kanye had mishandled Designer. But Designer wasn't the only artist who had been done dirty. Later on, Tiana Taylor left the label and even went as far to say that she might retire because of how badly she was treated by good music, stating, I'm going to feel underappreciated if I'm putting 100% in and my label is giving me, what, 10% of that? I put in a lot of work. I felt like the label wasn't hearing me and seeing me. I feel underappreciated. It's not that I'm retiring permanently, it's more like I don't want to move another inch for the company. So she had had it. In 2020, she further dogged on the label saying, I can go in front, I'm feeling super underappreciated as an artist receiving little or no real music from the machine constantly getting the shorter end of the stick and being overlooked. So she had just confirmed what everyone was thinking at the time. So after all of this would come out, and people would look at Kanye saying, hey man, what's going on? You would think Kanye would say, hey, none of that is true. But instead, to everyone's surprise, he actually agreed and said he would wanted to get rid of his label for a while. Good music sh now. And Scooter ain't gonna be no, oh, I'm still putting my name on it. I need to get rid of good music because I'm great. And guess what? Good is the enemy of great. What I'm doing giving Wanna Love You to Tiana. What the I'm doing giving that Daytona album to Pusha? What the I'm doing, bro? Like, I, that shit was three dark fantasies that I gave away. Cop shot the kid, Nas rapping all goddamn offbeat on it, don't even want to shoot a video. They shoot the video, don't even tell me. These motherfuckers don't appreciate me. All these motherfuckers are trying to use me. I'm the greatest motherfucking artist living, and I can do everything. So Kanye just admitted to thinking he was way better than everyone on the label, which I'm not going to lie, 
He's not wrong. And explained from his point of view, he was just giving them handouts for his career, which he was done with. So it was in his best interest to derail the careers of those signed to him. That might be a bit overdramatic, but it's true. And the worst part is his fan base is so large and so strong that everyone just laughed it off and agreed with him, rather than thinking of the repercussions of what would happen to the artist's careers. Furthermore, Kanye's other artist, 070 Shake, flopped and stayed in the same position she was. Prior to that, people were saying she could be Kanye's greatest protege, but nothing ever happened. So in 2020, the label is winding down, and in 2021, the only artists that were left were Kanye, Pusha T, Big Sean, and 070 Shake. In September of 2020, Kanye said he would give back 50% of the share of the masters he owned. The artists were actually super happy, but he never actually gave them back. Then, after all the controversy that ensued with Kanye in his own personal life, which I'm sure you know about, but I won't speak about, Pusha T and 070 Shake left the label. Push personally had this to say about Kanye's behavior. Stuff is being said today that is beyond disappointing. It's nothing to dance around, this is wrong, period. Announcing he would be distancing himself from Kanye and saying he would no longer be the president of good music. It got so bad that 070 Shake even said, to be honest, good music is not a thing. Nobody works for good music. Meaning there was no one left at the record label. It was just Kanye. However, one artist stayed loyal throughout the entire period. And that was Big Sean, who was the last artist left. He had been treated the worst out of everyone, but since he owed Kanye so much, he decided to stay loyal. However, rather than being rewarded by Kanye, something much worse happened. And this is what being a doormat will get you in life. After over a decade of loyalty, Kanye absolutely spazzed out on Big Sean for no reason whatsoever. On a podcast, Kanye burnt his final bridge and disrespected Big Sean worse than anyone else on the label, saying, When I die, <laughs> On my tombstone, it's gonna say, I deserve to be here because I signed Big Sean. This was crazy, especially when you factor in how loyal Big Sean was to Kanye. And Big Sean's response will just make you feel a lot of pity. He tried to laugh it off at first. At first, I thought it was hilarious. Right. I thought this shit was funny. But then he was insulted. He was Good Music's most loyal and high achieving artist that had stayed on the label the entire way through. Right. Then I took it personal. Right, cool. I took it personal because. I'm the only artist who's put out five albums under good music. Cuddy left a long time ago, mm -hmm. business-wise. You know what I'm saying? And they mm -hmm. still clicked up and linked up, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm the only artist who put out five albums under good music. I'm the only one who put out back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back number ones, platinum albums, double platinum albums. At least until then. He then explained that when he first signed his deal, it was one of the worst deals ever signed. When... <laughs> When I heard what he was talking about, it didn't make sense, bro, because, you know, my manager saw my record deal and said, this is a shitty record deal. He then explained that once he spent tons of money himself to find out where the money that was owed to him had gone. This man, I had to spend my own money auditing my label because millions of dollars are missing. And you can tell when millions of dollars are missing. Of course. Right? Yes. And after it was all said and done, it turned out Kanye had it all along. He just didn't pay Sean. Keep in mind, he was a billionaire at this point. You should be. I, I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on my label mm -hmm. thinking Universal owed me this money and the money had been paid to good music. So he explained he left and he had to get a larger cut of his music and that he missed what it was like when it was just one big family in good music. They did reunite and are cool now, but only because of how professional Big Sean is. So that brings us to today where as of 2024, there are no other artists left on good music. And I'm not gonna lie, after this video, it's just sad how much potential was lost due to naive artists signing to the artists they idolized, from Kid Cudi to Designer. It's pretty much impossible to equally help massive superstars and supporting artists, so maybe it just doesn't work. Is it really their fault? It's hard to say. But at the end of the day, you have to take responsibility for everything that happens to you. So I'll leave the judging up to you guys. But I think the key takeaways are that Signing to a rapper with other focuses, such as Kanye, in politics, fashion, his family, that's one of the largest artists in the world, never even wanted a label, and isn't even a great person, isn't a great idea. The next rapper on this list is none other than Travis Scott. Travis Scott is one of the biggest artists in the world today. However, he's failed miserably at assembling a solid label and has done through through a series of poor decisions. And today, Cactus Jack is in shambles. But of course, before we talk about the fall, we need to ask, how did Cactus Jack even come to fruition in the first place? Cactus Jack was created by Travis Scott back in 2017, right before he was going to drop his now legendary album, Astroworld. And after the announcement of his new label, Travis seemed to be really excited. In an interview, he explained it was actually just to help his fellow artists, saying his main focus was getting new artists in the game without major labels taking advantage of it. Wow, very noble, Mr. Scott. And who better to help out than poor old Smoke Perp, right? 
Perp was seen in the studio with Travis, got himself a feature, a music video, and Travis Scott even executive produced for his first album, Dead Star. But one day, out of the blue, Travis just ditched him, which was very confusing. And after he ditched him, leaked that Alamo Records, Perp's label, had paid Travis to give Perp some exposure, and it was a publicity stunt for Perp and a cash grab for Travis, which wasn't a great look for Travis and definitely a cheap stain on his legacy. So the whole helping fellow artist thing went straight out the window and the label wasn't off to a great start. So Travis needed a new signee to create a good foundation for the record label. Just a few months later, Travis would sign the hottest up and coming rapper at the time, Sheck West. At the time, it was someone Travis really believed in. Mo Bamba was blowing up and Sheck West was a budding young star. And in the beginning, it was largely a huge success, except it wasn't due to Travis. For several months, Sheck West's career potential seemed limitless due to Mo Bamba just blowing up and blowing up. Then he teased his album Mud Boy, which was announced to release in 2018, right before Astroworld and fans were hyped. Afterwards, Travis would make one more move, but at the time he'd keep them under wraps. No one knew, but Travis had signed another artist by the name of Don Tolliver. However, he was unknown at the time. And when Sheck West dropped his album, it wasn't horrible, but it wasn't amazing either. It only sold 25k and went number 17 on the Billboard charts, which wasn't amazing considering the wild success of Mo Bamba. So, so far, everything has gone off to a rough start until a new star came around, Don Tolliver. But remember, for marketing reasons, Don's signing was kept a secret. And when Travis Scott dropped Astroworld, he put Don as a feature with hidden vocals on the song Can't Say that had fans in shock, wondering who this unknown feature was. Furthermore, Sheck would also be featured on No Bystanders, and his music and energy had been getting a lot of positive feedback, so it looked like Travis had assembled a solid roster around him. The following year, in 2019, things would be even better. Don Tolliver had a breakout year, capitalizing on his hype from Astroworld, releasing single after single. His debut album hit number 7 on Billboard, very solid for a debut artist, and many of the songs would blow up later. Songs like No Idea and After Party each have over a half a billion streams on Spotify. And Don became the guy that made it seem like, okay, Travis knows what he's doing. He marketed him well, he genuinely made good music, and it really looked like he was going to be a force commercially as well. And he did, overtaking Sheck West and becoming the main character in Cactus Jack. However, while Don Tolliver was blowing up, Sheck West was struggling to even stay relevant. Yes, he was already a big name, but his releases were very random and he struggled to create a solid fan base. And by 2019, it was safe to say that Sheck had fallen off, solely because he took his foot off the gas and a couple of other mistakes he made. But all hope was not lost for the label, as at the end of the year, Travis announced that Cactus Jack would have their first collab mixtape. In January 2020, it dropped. Jack Boys featured Don Tolliver, Sheck West, Pop Smoke, Rosalia, Lil Baby, Quavo, Offset, and Young Thug. It performed well both musically and commercially, selling 154k first week, which was a huge W. So things weren't looking too bad after all. Although Sheck and Don didn't have the potential Travis did when he was young, they were almost like role players but for Travis's team, and it worked perfectly. And in 2021, they would add to the roster. In January of that year, a new artist would be added to the Cactus Jack lineup, and he was a product of the new wave SoundCloud age, an artist named Sofago, who when signed, looked like a perfect addition for the label. Sofago was a budding young star, still a teenager, and had what seemed like endless potential, especially after two songs, Knock Knock and Adding, went viral on TikTok and reached hundreds of millions of streams. If you were on TikTok, Sofago was inescapable. So signing Sofago was a no-brainer, except that was the easy part. Now it was up to Travis to develop him. And so it began. Sofago was being touted as Travis's new protege. It almost looked like a perfect fairy tale storyline. Things were looking great on Sofago's side as well as he was every industry head's prediction to become the next big star to come out of SoundCloud, which had everyone wondering who he was. And when Travis signed him, fans were like, it's happening. Except Travis made a bunch of errors with Sofago. First of all, signing Travis should have been a huge win and boost, but instead Sofago fumbled his entire career. Let me explain. At the time, Fago fans were super eager to hear his debut studio album, Pink Hearts. After all, in the two years prior to that, Fago had released 10 projects, so it wasn't a crazy expectation for fans to expect a new album. But instead, they got something else. A trippy red feature. Woohoo! Then, Fago dropped a single, which snippet made more noise than the full release itself for how he played with the mic, and so Fago's career seemed to be stalling. However, his momentum wasn't going anywhere. Knock Knock was still going up on TikTok, and he even appeared on Don Tolliver's album. Furthermore, it wouldn't have been that bad. I mean, there's nothing wrong with taking your time, as long as it's not a millennia. However, Sofago's competition was taking off. Yeet, 
who was just a rising star at the time, was going crazy, dropping hit after hit. Another artist, Ken Carson, Playboy Cardi signing, was taking off as well. Fago was nowhere to be seen. Leading up to Fago's Pink Hearts, the conversation that Ye was a bigger artist than him began to form. And at the time, Fago was much larger. But pretty soon, fans started to turn on Fago and agree. Eventually, Destroy Lonely, another Playboy Cardi artist, who Fago was also miles ahead of earlier, would overtake him as well. So not only were things not looking good for Fago, his competition had caught up, and the pressure was on. However, before he got the chance to prove himself, one of the biggest tragedies in concert history occurred. And at the thing is, like, you know, people pass out, you know, people, you know, things happen at concerts, but something like that, it's just like... In November of 2021, Travis was at his annual Astroworld Festival, where there was a crowd crush injuring 30 and... The audience tried to get Travis to stop the show after things were getting wild, but he didn't. In 2015, Travis pleaded guilty to reckless endangerment after he told fans to climb barricades at his shows. That same year, Travis ordered fans at his show to give a fan in the crowd the beats. So the evidence began pointing in the direction that Travis Scott wasn't the nicest person. As a result, Travis's reputation took a huge hit and has never really recovered. And so not only did this mean that Travis Scott's career was impacted, so Fago's career was also put on the back burner, as well as all of Cactus Jack. But Travis Scott was the most hated man in the world at the time, so he had other problems to deal with. At this point, it seemed like the cons had outweighed the pros of signing to Travis. Travis was the one that kept the bus going, and when he went down, the others came down with him, no matter how innocent they were. Apparently, Cactus Jack artists were even barred from speaking to the press at the time. This would of course affect Don Tolliver's career, as well as Sheck West's, but it affected Sofago's the most, because he was the newest artist who still hadn't dropped his debut studio album. The wait for Sofago's album was long, but it shouldn't have been this long, and it wouldn't have been if Travis's Astroworld tragedy had not happened. After that, no one under Cactus Jack could release music due to what had happened for months. Utopia, Travis's next album, was planned to drop very soon, and just like Astroworld had done for Don Tolliver, could have given Fago a lot of promotion for his album, but that wasn't possible now. Then, Yeet sold 35,000 first week, and things got even worse, because it showed everyone what an artist from the underground like Fago had the potential to do. So the spotlight was now on Fago to perform, and remember when I told you that Fago kept telling his fans his album Pink Hearts was coming? Well, years later, no one was waiting. On November 11, 2022, So Fago dropped Pink Hearts, and it was underwhelming to say the least. Fago's fans weren't even happy with it. It featured DJ Khaled, Lil Uzi, Don Tolliver, and Ken Carson, but there was one person missing, Travis Scott, which everyone was really confused about. Moreover, Pink Hearts wouldn't even hit the Billboard 200, which is crazy for an artist with hundreds of millions of streams and an embarrassment for Cactus Jack. It didn't even sell 8,000 units. In other words, he went double plastic. After all the Nike commercials, Jimmy Kimmel performances, performing at LeBron James's son's birthday party, and Apple Music promotion, Fago flopped. Furthermore, Fago flopping was now a stain on Travis's image, so he didn't really show any love to him publicly and still hasn't, likely trying to hide him. And to be honest, the flop wouldn't have been that bad if so Fago was able to pick himself up and keep going. But rather than taking it on the chin, Fago's ego was bruised and he blamed the fans, posting this. Rather cut out all the fake ass supporting fans and rock with the people who really mess with me. But fans thought to themselves, surely he'll be on Travis Scott's utopia, right? Since so Fago alluded to being on it. I can't tell you that. I can't tell you that. You know I can't tell you that. <laughs> after all, that's how Travis pushed Don Tolliver and Sheck West. And after being responsible for Fago's album delaying due to the Astroworld controversy, you'd think that Travis Scott would make up for it by giving him a feature on Utopia, right? Nope, Fago was nowhere to be seen on the album. So, so Fago being on Utopia, the big break Fago fans were waiting for didn't happen. But then fans thought, maybe he'll take So Fago on the Utopia tour. Just maybe. To give him some exposure? Nope, not even that. Instead, he chose an artist named Tizo Touchdown, who wasn't even signed to Travis, and was a nobody a couple years ago compared to Fago. He is pretty hard though. But what's really a bummer to me was the fact that Sofago was never really given a fair shake. Though there were unfortunate circumstances, during those years, Sofago's fans left and moved to other artists, and he's never seen the same popularity since. After that, Sofago toured with Nav, but fans had fallen out with the idea of Sofago becoming the next big thing of SoundCloud. To them, he was a bust. Fago's next project also failed the chart as well, but he could still come back. He's only 20 and has been building his foundation for years. He just needs to be pushed onto the next level. And hey, Travis Scott still had Don Tall right that year 
Don dropped a track called Do It Right, and surprisingly, it gained millions of views in hours after being released on YouTube. So fans were thinking, okay, this guy is really doing something. However, it was leaked that Don Tolliver was paying for views. This was because Atlantic Records was bonding their artists allegedly, but it didn't matter. To the public, it was an L for Cactus Jack and Travis, who they thought was the one botting views. And it was really obvious they were botted. After that, Don Tolliver's most recent album sold 17,000, which after all the success he received was a flop. And remember Shaq West? Well, the same can be said for him as well. Except, he didn't even get the chance to drop music. In 2020, Sheck was taped up on some gun charges in New York. According to the report, Sheck was pulled over for having excessively tinted windows. Officers reportedly searched the vehicle and found a loaded firearm. He was charged with two felonies and was facing time in prison. So if you couldn't tell by now, Sheck West was doing anything but dropping music. So much so that in 2022, he decided to become a professional basketball player. I'm not even joking. And it was even announced that he was eligible for the NBA draft. However, he went undrafted. As it turned out, it was all promoted for a single hashtag bin balling, which ended up flopping. But that turned out to be the least of Sheck's worries, because that year he was also met with some pretty serious abuse and essay allegations by Justine Skye. She took to social media to say, I literally have footage of you jumping over the fence in my crib to attack me, Sheck. Your lies are even more disrespectful. Sheck then promptly dropped a statement saying, I've chosen to remain silent until now out of respect for actual victims of the A word, and then denied the claims. But they caught him in 4K. Justine. Even a restraining order was filed against him. Then things didn't get better when former classmates of Sheck West came out and said he had a history of that type of behavior. And after the evidence that came forth, it was not a good look for both Sheck and Travis, who supported him. Furthermore, in 2023, Sheck could have made a comeback with Utopia and was so close. But Travis Scott cut his verse from Fiend, which became a massive hit featuring Playboy Cardi and was even performed at the Grammys. So it's almost like Travis doesn't even want his artists to shine. He even attempted to take the spotlight off of them to put the spotlight on the signing of an Instagram model. At this point, after all the mishaps, the failed signings, and the declining stock of Cactus Jack artists, Travis would stop signing artists altogether until he figured out how to revive his artists' careers. Well, in 2022, there was yet another weird incident that happened surrounding Cactus Jack when Malu Traveo signed to Cactus Jack. Malu blew up on TikTok and in October of 2021, Malu posted a TikTok saying, Can't believe you finally found out I got signed to my favorite motherfucking artist. And I can wait for you guys to hear all my motherfucking songs. It was Alita's birthday. I love you guys. And, ah! and on Instagram, writing, Birthday girl, I'm so happy dreams came true and got signed to Cactus Jack. By the way, for most fans, she was just considered an Instagram model, not really a musician. And this was the tipping point for those fans, especially the ones of Cactus Jack. They were so astonished by the signing that at first they didn't even believe it was real. But eventually, they found out it was true. Then, Malu explained three weeks later that she was leaving, which was odd. Why would an artist who is practically a nobody want to leave your label when you're one of the largest artists in the world and it was her dream to all her life? According to fans, it was because Travis got cold feet and blacked out, but Malu insisted it was all love. However, it didn't end amicably. A couple weeks later, Malu seemed really upset after hopping on Instagram Live, threatening to expose Travis if he didn't let her go from her contract, writing, like, why are you trying to hold me when you denied everything? Let me go now which meant Travis Scott was blocking her from releasing music. It seemed like there was a lot going on behind the scenes, but Malu was eventually released from the contract, and this was just another negative stain on Cactus Jack. So one common theme between the artist and Cactus Jack is that Travis Scott rarely puts in any thought into who signs to Cactus Jack. There's no common theme, just random artists, which would be cool if they worked out. But of course, that hasn't happened. But hey, at least he got Don Tolliver, Sheck West, Sofago, and himself front seats to a Dior fashion show in 2022. So. That must have been nice, right? Okay, so today Cactus Jack is kind of in shambles. There's no real direction and it doesn't seem like there'll be one for a while. Sheck West released a song with a Face Clan member. In 2023, it got so bad that Travis Scott unfollowed Sofago. You get the idea. So why did they fail? Travis failed because he didn't know or doesn't know how to direct the careers of anyone on his label. Not much thought would be put into the marketing schemes of the newly signed artists. For example, Travis Scott's cosign wasn't really enough to give Sofago a boost. In fact, it really did nothing. 
unlike someone like Playboy Cardi, who never even publicly mentioned his artists, but still devised a plan for them to blow up and gain their own cult fan bases. But no one would mess up as bad as the final rapper on this list. That being the CEO himself, Rich the Kid, who has his own record label, Rich Forever. But before we talk about the label's demise, we have to talk about the man who started it all, right? Rich the Kid began dropping music in 2013, dropping mixtapes and collaboration projects with the Migos, McConan, and even songs with Playboy Cardi. And this really put him on the map. But that's not enough, because before we look at why Rich Forever failed, we also have to look at why it was started. Rich the Kid came up with the Migos, dropping a couple of collab tapes together, and even moved in with them when he was broke. However, the downside to all of this was that he was always seen as a sidekick, which he hated. He was even known as the fourth member of the Migos. So, to skirt the label of a sidekick, Rich created his own label, literally. Which should make it clear that this was an ego-driven move, because it wasn't really to help others, but more so to bolster his own reputation as a main character rather than a sidekick, and have others as his own sidekick. So using that logic, he would never really let others in his label surpass him, because that's exactly what he started the label for in the first place. Moreover, starting a label before you've even become successful is unheard of, and Rich the Kid was a little crazy for even trying it in the first place. But in June of 2016, after really wanting to establish his own brand and identity, Rich Forever was signed to 300 Entertainment off of the massive success of the album Trap Talk, or mixtape I should say. He'd follow up, dropping Rich Forever 2, that received features from Lil Uzi, Lil Yachty, Young Thug, Jane Smith, and even Playboy Cardi. And from right at that moment, Rich made it clear he was coming for the throne. That year, Rich would sign his first artist, and to be honest, this was a killer signing. It's like Rich had a great eye for talent, as to be honest, Famous Dex was more talented and a better rapper than Rich. At the time, he was buzzing, and linking up with Rich the Kid was supposed to take him to the top. And for a short while, it looked like that's where things were heading. However, there were still concerns that Rich Forever would detract from Rich the Kid's solo career, which at the time was very promising. Remember, in 2017, Rich the Kid was at the top of his game. People really believed he was going to be something, so much so that even some legends in hip hop decided to co-sign him, like Kendrick Lamar, who never gives features to SoundCloud rappers. On top of that, three months after signing Dex, Rich signed the Brooklyn rapper known as Jay Critch, who was practically a nobody at the time. However, as I said earlier, Rich had an incredible eye for talent and somehow just predicted Jay's success, and with that, he had enough talent to solidify the label. However, there were always signs that Rich Forever may not last the test of time. They always had little arguments, for example, in 2017, they had a playful beef. Man, that sh Rich the Kid got on that sh ain't nothing. That sh weak, you Look, the video? That video, yeah, that sh weak. Rich, you can't dress like me! That same year, Dex tried to get out of his deal with Rich, hanging to Instagram Live to say that he didn't have any problems with Rich, but he wasn't happy with his label situation. However, these minor disagreements were patched up, and the next year, Rich Forever would make some serious dents in the rap industry. The trio had chemistry unlike any other rap group fans had ever seen. Let me explain. Each artist in the trio had their own lane, and they all complemented each other differently. Rich was from Atlanta, Dex was from Chicago, and Jay was from New York. Dex was going on a monster run on SoundCloud, and Rich too, going on to release a number of collab tapes and singles that would just be hit after hit after hit. It seemed like the trio had the world in their hands, at least the rap world. However, many were still concerned that Rich Forever would detract from Rich the Kid's career, as well as stunt the growth of other artists' careers, because how could Rich focus on both, right? Well, Rich decided to prove everyone wrong, and in the beginning, it looked like he was about to defy the odds. Famous Dex dropped Dex Meets Dexter, which went gold, and singles like Japan and Pick It Up did astronomical numbers. However, fans thought, could Rich do those type of numbers? It looked like it. He proceeded to drop his debut album, The World Is Yours, debuting at number 2 on the Billboard charts and selling 59k first week. The hit song, Plug Walk, hit number 13 on Billboard, and Dex's singles were climbing up too, hitting number 28 on Billboard. So two artists had had breakout mainstream hits, a successful rollout of each album, and a bright future ahead of themselves, at least so it seemed. But what's very clear and very interesting is in the beginning, Rich the Kid really put on for Famous Dex and Jay Critch. He opted to put out label mixtapes rather than his own, and he really built their careers before he had a solo hit of his own and went crazy himself. At one point, Famous Dex was even bigger than Rich the Kid, so most people thought, this guy is really selfless, huh? However, as time would go on, things would change quite drastically. That year, in 2018, Dex randomly took to Instagram Live to explain that Rich the Kid was not the selfless rapper everyone thought of him to be. Was watching me live and comment on my shit. They they they, they brother and all this and be hey wanna see in, wanna see a nigga downfall. My mama gray the same niggas you be with don't wanna see you come up that's why I'm nobody bro I'm signing 300 on my son and I'm Dexter I created my own wave. Dex explained that Rich wanted to see him fall off 
and that he didn't need rich. Later, he told everyone he was actually independent, saying, Oh, I'm just so happy with free man. I ain't sent to nobody. <laughs> yes. Nice try, Dex. And it was kind of sad to see him attempt to lie to everyone to make himself feel better. At the time, things were looking pretty bad between Rich and Dex. However, very soon, the two patched things up and the relationship was good again. As they were promoting another collab tape and it looked like Rich Forever was about to go on another run in the industry. However, rather than focus on music, Rich the Kid would go on one of the most embarrassing runs a rapper has been through in the past decade. How so? Well, during 2018, after seeing so much success, Rich the Kid was still trying to sign more rappers to his label, which is fair. However, for some odd reason, he thought that he'd be able to sign Lil Uzi Vert, or at least pretended to, back when Lil Uzi was beefing with his label. Rich chimed in, tweeting, that's why you should have signed to Rich Forever. Uzi, justifiably offended, wrote, boy, I'm not signing for 20 racks. Rich then went on the cruise show and said he wouldn't sign Uzi for personal reasons, acting like he could have signed Uzi when Uzi was way bigger than him. This was totally uncalled for and random, as Uzi and Rich actually used to be friends. So of course, this would spawn a beef between the two. Uzi responded to Rich's interview by posting a picture of him and a crab and tagging Rich as the crab. Rich then fired back by dropping a song called Dead Friends where he dissed Uzi. The track was very disrespectful. Uzi is a artist who signed away all his rights to his label. You and that little Uzi bird, man. You said he's your son? And Rich even hired an Uzi lookalike to be given the beats in a music video. Uzi then dropped Rich Forever, which was way better. But until then, Rich was honestly holding his own. However, remember how Rich paid an Uzi lookalike to get the beats? Well, Uzi wasn't a poser. He was the real thing. And eventually, he stand on business when he caught Rich in Philly. Uzi confronted Rich, who was scared and ran into a Starbucks, hiding behind the counter. Uzi called for him to come out, politely, but he refused. After that, he was forced to squash the beef, and Uzi dropped a turn take, selling 250k first week. More than all of Rich the Kid's first week sales, to this day, combined. This really hurt Rich Forever's image, I mean badly. First, your own artist, who's huge, says he wants off your label, even lies that he's off it. Then Lil Uzi publicly embarrasses you. Moreover, in 2018, fans felt like the trio was drifting apart. They weren't really around each other, and music wasn't being put out like it once was. And it turned out, once again, this was none other than the boss man himself, Rich the Kid's fault. Remember, the Rich Forever label was created with 300 Entertainment as the parent company, the same one Young Thug is signed to. However, it didn't take long for cracks to start forming in Rich and the label's relationship. They'd get into a ton of arguments, which honestly were definitely Rich's fault, and Rich would publicly diss 300 Entertainment, which is a stellar way to handle a disagreement with someone who's in control of your career. Except, luckily for Rich, he was able to get away. He got out of his deal with 300 Entertainment, which would have been great, except he'd leave Famous Dex behind with them. This was horrible for multiple reasons. Number one, Rich had just abandoned Famous Dex. Furthermore, with him gone and the label knowing that if Dex did well, Rich would make money off of him, didn't exactly incentivize them to push Famous Dex's career. And what would you know? Dex would express his frustration with the label rolling out his album. Dex is a super nice guy, so this would have never happened if he was just signed directly underneath the label. So he'd feel ashamed that he had just dropped a Billboard charting single and had been left stranded with a label that wanted to see him fall off. So he tried to lie that he was independent, once again. But in reality, he was still signed. And I really do feel bad for him. Until now, Famous Dex had been relatively quiet. I was actually supporting Rich no matter what. He was really a ride or die. But I guess this was the tipping point, as he would go on Instagram Live and air Rich out, saying, I'm not rich forever. I am signed to 300. It's your kid's selfish ass she's trying to sell Rich Forever for. You're not trying to get me and Jay Chris shit. He basically claimed that Rich was greedy and didn't do anything for him or Jay Critch, which when taking a look at Jay Critch's track record, made sense. So if the people who signed to you are saying you're a bad person, and the people who signed you are saying you suck, you might just not be a great person. What's funny is even the people he used to be signed to, Quality Control, that they didn't like him either and actually bragged they were still making money off of it. But hey, at least Rich the Kid was a smart guy and savvy businessman, right? Well, it turns out he was quite the opposite and he'd find himself drowned in legal trouble. It started when he was paid 100k by Fashion Nova to mention them in a song. All he had to do was say one line, but he didn't and was sued for 130,000 in damages, which he had to pay. But that's small, right? What's 130k to Rich the Kid, the CEO himself? Well, afterwards, Rich's old management group, Blueprint Management, sued him after he didn't pay them their share of his earnings, which amounted to 3.5 million. And once again, 
Rich was court ordered by a judge to pay it, this time with significant interest. Ouch. Then a jeweler said he owed him $200,000. A month later, another judge ruled that Rich had to pay 300k to the landlord that he rented a mansion from back in 2018 for more damages. It seemed like Rich owed everyone and their mom an exorbitant amount of money, which just meant that he was showing that he had a lot more money than he had and couldn't keep up with any of his expenses. What did this mean for his label though, right? Well, when the CEO of your label is losing millions in legal fees, it might not be the smartest idea to stay on your label. And Jay Critch understood that. So after seeing all the messes that Rich had gotten himself into, he decided he was out. So in 2021, Jay Critch announced he was leaving Rich Forever for good, along with a diss saying, I'm not Rich Forever, that shit been a dub. On Instagram, Rich clapped back saying, loyalty over royalty. According to Rich, Jay had went behind his back and snaked him over 100k, cutting a new deal that cut him out of the picture and claimed that he made Jay Critch. I signed Jay when I had a two bedroom apartment. I flew him out when I had 5k to my name. I signed him, gave him a platform and made him who he is today. I got him a new deal to get out of this bad one. He then tried to snake me and go behind my back for a little bag. He then said, I haven't made a dollar off of you. I put you on tour with Future your first year of being signed. I put you on and you have no loyalty and called Jay ungrateful. Jay clapped back and said, some of these rappers are just like lawyers at the labels. Don't trust them, snakes. If y'all want new music, go tell them, free critch, ho ass. Followed by, toss you out. You trying to control my deal with my lawyer? I'm a grown man. I can run my own deal, silly. And you not like that, chill. It looked like it was about to be a big beef, but they squashed it and it looks like Rich has come to terms with Jay leaving his label. But beefing with your label slash groupmates only matters if you guys are doing well. And Rich Forever was not doing well. Starting off with the one star of the label, Famous Dex. Ever since Rich abandoned him, Dex would never recover and would go through multiple legal issues himself, domestic, robbery of a watch, running for the police, and substance abuse issues that still plague him to this day. By then, all three of their careers were doing pretty badly. Jay Critch had fallen off the map by 2021, and Rich the Kid's career was barely holding on by a thread. When Rich Forever 4 dropped, it was clear that the label was no longer what it was, and the project was just no good. But Rich the Kid was not going to give up without a fight, and it looked like the boss man was making some serious moves to make a comeback, which he had to fight tooth and nail to even make happen. So I guess I gotta commend that. Previously, to get out of his 300 entertainment deal, he had to pay 800000 and announced he was independent. However, that obviously wasn't going to work for him, so he decided to sign a deal with Republic Records, his third label in three years. Knowing he didn't have too many chances left, Rich decided to pull together everything he had and dropped his third studio album, Boss Man, with features from Post Malone, Nicki Minaj, and Future. It sold 20k in the first week. This was a huge flop, and Rich was dropped from his label once again. At that point, Famous Dex had completely fallen off, spent a year in jail, went to rehab, dropped a bunch of bad music, dissed Rich the Kid, made up with Rich the Kid, and when he was done with all of that, he was at the lowest point he had ever been. At one point, it was so bad that he thought he was trending on Apple Music. The whole time, he didn't realize it, but he had just looked at his latest searches. Rich seemed to have hit rock bottom too, and from there, things just seemed to be over. However, Rich Forever had a little bit of gas left in the tank, and in 2023, they began posting snippets together, dropping a song called Big Dog on Lyrical Lemonade, which reached over 2 million views and had a great reception from fans who thought maybe, just maybe, Rich Forever could make a comeback. However, before fans could even get their hopes up, Famous Dex himself would say that Rich Forever was a thing of the past. Right after the song on Lyrical Lemonade was posted, Famous Dex came out against Rich the Kid and explained he was no longer Rich Forever. I ain't trying to kick you with nobody. I'm just not Rich Forever no more. I'm independent. Grow up! I don't hang around the same people I hang around no more. Fuck. The thing is this time, he was being for real and just explained that he was too loyal to Rich and just wanted to be treated right. It was pretty clear to me and everyone else that Rich the Kid was a selfish and greedy person. The thing is, these aren't just assumptions I'm making either. Famous Dex came out and said it himself, word for word. Rich was selfish, and that's why no one around him hung out with him anymore. All they did was try and stay down with him, but he never reciprocated. Furthermore, what's really messed up is that Rich would use Famous Dex's goodwill he had built with Cole Bennett to get his own Lyrical Lemonade video. If you didn't know, Rich the Kid asked Cole for a video for one of his albums, and Cole said no, as he had already done one earlier that year with them. Rich then accused them of being a culture vulture and said tons of other disrespectful stuff and destroyed his relationship with them. Dex, however, was the first person to get Cole's videos to blow up. So Cole was indebted to him forever, which is why Dex was always booked at Lyrical Lemonade's festival and he still gets videos and they're good friends. Knowing this, Rich used him to get another song on the channel for Rich Forever. So the whole time, while fans were like, damn, this is hard, the trio is back, it was really just Rich manipulating Dex, nothing else. Dex explained he had been tricked. Basically said Rich Forever is over and done with 
he was separating himself from all of them, and how could he blame him after all the times Rich had used them? But he did say he would always love Rich the Kid, he just couldn't be a part of his label anymore. By the way, he wasn't lying this time. And lastly, Dex took to Instagram Live where he explained, Go look at all them videos in the, with the Goyard, nigga. I had a gun on me, nigga. I'm just risking my life, nigga. Oh, my son, nigga. Will kill anybody for you. He was heartbroken after realizing years later that Rich never wanted the best for him. It was all a front, it was all a show, and as someone who was really rocking with him, it just made me feel bad. Dex explained that at one point he was willing to do anything for Rich, but after seeing that Rich didn't actually want the best for him, he was heartbroken. So that brings us to today, where Rich the Kid's record label Rich Forever is stagnant, and the days where they were once newcomers to the industry with endless potential are long gone. The lesson here is pretty simple, and there's actually one for Rich and one for the artist. For Rich, it's the only focus on one thing. Rich's mistake was he tried to build his career along with his label, whereas if he had just focused on his career, he may actually have been successful. The other lesson is to not assign to a not so smart person. Rich the Kid is quite possibly one of the dumbest rappers I've ever come across, at least business wise. I really like some of his old music. The amount of times he's been sued for hundreds of thousands or even millions is insane and he loses every single time. Really ironic considering his name is Rich the Kid. So as an artist, you have to be wary of how much business knowledge the rapper you're signing to has, even if they call themselves a CEO. Scratch that, especially if they call themselves a CEO. So overall, signing to a rapper is like the ultimate cosign. Their initial goal is to take you in and show you the path that it takes to be successful. However, rarely is this how we see it go down. It is true that you can get a huge boost of clout by attaching your name to an established star. However, as you've seen, it comes with its issues. The shadow can be too large to outrun, you could be placed in a box, your career could be ruined, they could just not care about you. And for another artist to give an artist a shot and see that artist become bigger than the artist themselves could be tough for a lot of people. So let me know, is signing to a rapper the right move or is it not? See you in the next video.